a log, no time to spare. The crazy world has gone astray. And Jesus is the only way. Zimmerang, Zimmerang, God made you and God made me. Zimmerang, Zimmerang, all the old and young ones do. Near or far, no matter where you are. Zimmerang, Zimmerang, hey, we're all one family. We're gonna do it again, here we go. Zimmerang, Zimmerang, yeah, God made you and God made me. Zimmerang, Zimmerang, all the old and young ones do. Near or far, no matter where you are. Zimmerang, Zimmerang, hey, we're all one family. Awesome, thanks guys. The, I'm just gonna say the kids are louder. This one doesn't have hand motions as much, uh, but um, oh, I went the wrong way. The kids were louder, so you guys got to step it up on this one. This is more of a uh, more of just a fun one, but it has a good principle. We talk about all the animals. God made all different kinds of animals, but He made us special. He made us different. We can't. We didn't come from monkeys. We didn't come from something else. He made us separate and special. So here's all the. Uh, so we're just gonna talk about different animals and how wonderfully we are made. Sometimes I'm bored. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. One back, numb back, take it back, back, back. So many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikey, cougar bear, ha ha, barracool living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a crock, pond fish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. What a great God, I'm so wonderfully made. Oh yeah. Now the thing is, that's how it starts, right? So now we gotta go faster. We're gonna see how fast we go. Here we go. So you gotta get those names down pretty quick. Yeah, here we go. We'll go medium speed first. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, back, numb back, kick it back, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lord, keep cooking there, ha ha, drink oil, living in the sea. Flying fox, turn the clock, clown fish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. What a big God, I'm so wonderfully made. Oh yeah. Now, usually the kids really kind of start running around, but we're going to see how fast. You, you, we'll try to keep you guys in your seats a little, little bit, okay? So let's see how fast we're going to go. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, cow, wallow, wobble, tree. Wombat, numb back, kick it back, drag back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lord, keep cooking, bear, ah, wrangle, living in the seat. Flying fox, turn it back, drop the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Wonderfully made, God, I'm so wonderfully made. I'm going to drop my pick. <laughs> so the kids had a good time. Thanks, guys. All right. You may be seated, children. <laughs> As you can imagine, they did not stay very still. But they had fun with these. And it got the message across. All right. Let's spend just a few moments and think about some of these things. Marcy read uh, the scripture, Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 31, that tells uh, about the, the sixth day of creation after creating animal life. And then God says, let us make man in our likeness, in our image rather, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man, or as the ESV says, mankind. In his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What does this mean, in his own image? God never says that about any other aspect of his creation. Out of the universe, he made earth. And Earth is unique among planets. Just a few characteristics that make it habitable to humans is our distance from the sun, the size of our sun, the size of the total solar system, the tilt and rotation of the Earth, and the orbit around the sun, the composition of the atmosphere of Earth, and 
And the elements that are available on the earth, there are heavy metals that are necessary for human existence on this planet. Um, some have, physicists and astronomers have summarized some of these things into concepts called the anthropic principle. And the anthropic principle means that all of these had to come together in order for human life to exist on this planet. And the, 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 John Clayton, my friend who's the former atheist and became a Christian and, and lectures on the subject, Does God Exist? Uh, I saw a presentation he has done where he takes all of the characteristics that are necessary for the existence of human life on Earth and he shows the, statistic, the, the statistical probability of those things occurring naturally. And when you add up the odds of it happening, it becomes, the possibility is like one times 10 to the gazillionth that life could exist on the earth. It becomes statistically impossible. So this answers one question. The question is, is there life someplace else in the universe? It's highly unlikely. Now, if, if it is, it was created by God, but it's highly unlikely, which makes it so remarkable that there's life on this planet. Uh, also, some physicists talk about the fine-tuned universe that points to the unlikelihood of intelligent life existing. Arno Penzias is a, a Nobel Prize-winning physicist uh, not a Christian, by the way. I don't even know that he's a theist, but here's what he writes. Astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with a very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions required to permit life, and one which has an underlying, one might say supernatural, plan. That's what happens, see, because science cannot answer the question of ultimate origins. But science observes and looks at the results of God's creation and tries to analyze and figure, out, figure it out in ways to, to help mankind. That's the purpose of science. Genesis indicates that God specially designed the earth for human habitation. It wasn't an accident. In other words, he made this to be our home. When you look at the creation week from formless void to light, continents and seas, atmosphere, sun, moon, and stars, all the way through plant life and animal life, and then finally to the crowning glory of God's creation, you can see that it was put together in such a way to provide a home for us. Now, this should not make us arrogant, but it helps us understand in Genesis chapter 2, where God where it kind of recaps that sixth day and zooms in with more detail where it says, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He used the stuff that he'd already made. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. He literally handmade us. About everything else, God says, at the end of those creation days, he says, and God said, it was good. And everything else he makes by saying, by speaking it into existence. But when it comes to humans, he handcrafts us. And of course, you know how the woman came about. She wasn't made like us guys from mud. She was made from living tissue from Adam. Talk about handmade. It's almost like, I'm just speculating here. It's almost like he made us 
like a mud pie, you know, a, a mud person, breathe into us the breath of life. And then he said, I think I can do a little better. <laughs> Peggy just said a lot better. <laughs> I should, I asked for it, I guess. A whole lot better, yeah. But what makes us human? Anthropologists, those who study human development, cultures, even origins, they look for certain characteristics when they find skeletons. You know, they talk about cavemen. You know why they're called cavemen? Because they, they either lived in a cave or they were buried in a cave. You know what? I, I know some people who live in a cave. Well, they, they built the cave. It's on, down on Route 7, and they built their home underground. They're, they're cavemen and women. I'm not sure if they'd appreciate being called that, because that implies something, doesn't it? You know, knuckle dragging. <laughs> And they're not that way. But anyways, when they find these remains, these skeletons, these fossils of ancient humans, or they, they say ancient primates, they will say, OK, depending on where the spine goes into the skull, therefore the hole in the back of the skull where the spine goes in, you can tell whether somebody's a human or, or an ape. Really? I've got a couple of friends that I have breakfast with every Wednesday morning that, <laughs> that if you just found their, their skeleton, you wouldn't be sure which it was. <laughs> and they say, yeah, you're the one, Tim. <laughs> so really, this, even the skull size doesn't necessarily say. I, I've, I, I know some guys that have got really big heads and guys were with relatively small heads. Why do, why do they sell different size hats? Whether the person walked upright or on all fours, something that we sort of can tell, but you know what? I've seen a cat jump up on, and run on, on hind legs. They don't do it very long. We just say, that cat is in the process of evolution to become a human. I don't think that would be a rational conclusion, would it? What makes us humans? It's not physical characteristics. Peter Singer. Here's how Peter Singer is described in an article about him. He's a moral philosopher and ethicist at Princeton University. Listen to what he, he wrote. And this was because he had said something controversial, and so in an interview he was asked to clarify it. He said, newborn human babies have no sense of their own existence over time. So killing a newborn baby is never equivalent to killing a person. That is, a being who wants to go on living. That does not mean that it is not almost always a terrible thing to do so. It is, because, but that is because most infants are loved and cherished by their parents, and to kill an infant is usually to do a great wrong to, to her or his parents. Did you get the gist of that? The only thing, this eminent ethicist, bioethicist, medical ethicist at Princeton, the university that was started by Presbyterians to, change, to, to train their preachers. It was a Christian college in its early days. This ethicist, so-called ethicist, says the only thing that is terrible about killing a baby is because it hurts the baby's parents. Because they love him or her. 
Now, if you have a baby who is not loved by parents, killing the baby is no harm at all. Because that baby, according to Singer, is not yet a person. Not yet a person until this baby develops to the point of having an awareness of his future and wants a future. Now, how old would that be? Three months old? Six months old? A year old? How old would that be? Two years old? And therefore, according to his logic, it would be okay to kill a baby that has not quite reached that point of self-awareness. Kind of makes you think that we're in big trouble, doesn't it? This is a person who is training our doctors, our college students, who is influential, who is giving lectures on college campuses. But that, my subject is not talking about Singer. It's to say that what defines us as human is something different than this. It is, it tells us what in his image means. Think about this. In his image means that we think, that we reason, that we gather and analyze information. Being made in his image means that we have relationships with each other, friendships, parent to child, sibling to sibling. We relate to each other. It means that we, we, we exercise altruism, that, that we do things for others that have absolutely no benefit to us. It means that we love, we have affection, that we feel, we are capable of empathy. In his image, that's what these, this means. It means that we create art, that, that we exhibit creativity, that we are makers. You know these seats you're sitting on? They prove that we are humans. Say, I don't quite get you, Tim. Well, when we built this building, after an earnest discussion, we decided not to bolt down pews. That we wanted to put seats that could be moved. And yet, we weren't satisfied with any chairs that were available at the time. So, you know, they've come a long way. They kind of, they copied us. There are a lot of chairs that are very similar to these available now for churches. We wanted something that we could link together and have the benefit of a pew. So when you had a family of little kids, they could all be sitting together and you could, you know, so that your arm would be long enough to thunk the last one when needed, only when needed. But also they could be unlinked and they could be movable and they could be flexible. And so the guy that was helping us with the construction of this building, he did the wood part. His name is Paul Cole. We found out that he does cabinet making in the winter. And he said, I could make chairs. And we said, wow. So we started designing prototypes. I did research on all the chairs that were available, borrowed some, got dimensions, what's the right height to make it, what's the right angle to make it, what's the most comfortable, what is going to have the most utility. And Paul made a couple of uh, prototypes for us and we decided on one. And we had a guy who is the best upholster who ever lived. 
in this church, and he's still here. We can't get rid of him. Nor would we want to. There you go. So Al Thiel said, I can make the seats, or I can make the upholstery for these. So these comfortable things, it's, it's because of Al. And we found carpeting, or we found fabric that actually, we, I think we chose the carpeting first, and we found, or we chose the fabric first, we found the carpet to match it. And uh, Al went to work manufacturing the backs and upholstering the seats of these things, and Paul was building the, the oak frames for him. So it was a result of all these things that make us human. We conceived of an idea, we reasoned through it, we counted the cost, we designed, we analyzed, all those things are human. So if you go into a cave and you find ancient bones and there are chairs like one of these, you know that a human lived there. No, you might not find one of these chairs, but you might find, and probably would find, where somebody had taken um, some iron oxide that they had found, and they made a paint out of it, and they, they painted the shape of a bison on the cave wall. Or they, they took uh, uh, magnesium oxide, which is really dark black, and they put a binder like egg yolk in that. And they made a, made a paint, and they, they drew an image of them hunting the bison. And you're, you're familiar with these cave drawings, aren't you? Some of you have gotten to see them. It's pretty amazing. And they say, yeah, that, that drawing is probably 3,000 years old. You say, wow, that's amazing. You mean they were creating art back then? Yeah. And so, Today, we do that, and you say, but I'm, I'm not very creative. I'm, I'm not an artist. Oh, yes, you are. Every time you choose, oh, I like this blouse, you're using that skill. Every time you say, you know, I think, honey, I'd like to rearrange the living room. And, and your husband says, this is the 10th time this year. <laughs> You're showing your creativity. <laughs> Every time you bake a pie, which I think is the highest art form, <laughs> and not only do you want it to taste wonderful, but you want it to look good so that it's worthy of a photo that would be posted on Facebook. You are showing your artistic side. And as far as I'm concerned, that's art. But that's not all that reflects the image of God, that shows that we are humans. It's that we search for higher meaning. A long time ago, there was a psychological research called Abraham Maslow. Some of you have heard of him, maybe studied about him in school. He talked about the hierarchy of needs. And, it, and, he, and he displayed it in a, in a triangle with, with like layers. And you know, the most basic layers is shelter and food and safety. At the very top, do you remember? It's like self-actualization. This has to do, ladies, we can hear you back there. It's like, it's like finding purpose and meaning in life. And granted, yes, his point was that people have to get some of these basic things established in order to work up toward that one. But the goal of growth as a human is to achieve this self-actualization, to finding out who you really are. And it involves seeking God, it involves worship. And you know, that's something we find in the most ancient of civilizations. Now, they don't always worship God the way we do. You know, they, maybe they make little idols 
little carved stones. If you've been to maybe the Cleveland Museum of Natural Art, you go to the Egyptian part, you see 3,000 year old civilization and they'll have little idols, little pagan deities. The Egyptians worship the sun, they'll give representations of that. And you say, oh, that paganism. I, see, I feel the same way, but then I think, but you know what? It shows that they were seeking. They were seeking something beyond themselves. They realize that they're not alone in the universe. There's got to be something more. They have an awareness. It's almost as if it's printed into who they are, into their consciousness. Wow. That's exactly what happened. God made us in his own image. And so there are people who are really tall and there are people who are really short, Connie Smith. There are people who are every shape, whose skin has over time adapted to every climate and atmosphere of this planet. And if you put them all together, they look so different. But the differences in them are minuscule compared to what is the same, and it comes down to the fact that they were made in the image of God. And that ought to humble us. It ought to bring us to say, God, I want to know you. He's given us a purpose a responsibility. I like this statement in Ecclesiastes chapter, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. It really summarizes what it's all about. When he says, now all has been heard, here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. That's literally what it says. Do you notice in this translation it, it puts in brackets the word duty? Most translations say the whole duty or purpose of man. It literally says, this is the whole of mankind. Keep God, fear God and keep his commandments. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Worship God, obey God. That is the whole of mankind. Hmm. And then, that extends to our fellow human beings. In these words from Jesus, in answer to a question, what's the greatest commandment? He brilliantly summarizes it to this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Seeking God, worshiping God, naturally results in loving our neighbor. Why? Because our fellow human beings are also created in the image of God. That's why they deserve our protection and our respect. That's why murder is wrong. That's why that's why slander is wrong. That's why theft is wrong. Because we're made in the image of God. It means he cares about us. He has a personal investment in us. And if you abandon this core truth that we're made in the image of God, then is a culture, we would be in deep trouble, and we are in deep trouble. Humanity is in deep trouble. And the answer is what we have, what we've been teaching our children this week. That's the answer. And we will continue to. Congress is not going to solve our nation's problems. They are not going to stop people killing each other. I guarantee you, they're going to try to make themselves look so good and smart. But they're ignoring the real problem. The church has the answer. It's been given to us by our Savior. We need to remember who we are and what the answer is. 
and it's bringing people back to realizing they're made in the image of God and bring them back into a relationship with Him and therefore a relationship with one another. Jesus went to the cross to pay for our sins so that God could woo us to Himself because He wants to give us a new heart and a new purpose so that we might become who God made us to be. Let's pray together. God of heaven, all the adults here, we are praying and begging you that what the children learned this week might stay with them for the rest of their lives. Might influence them in their home life, in their school life. And God, we also ask you to help us adults as we've been reminded of these truths to live as if we believe them. We know that this is not a matter of us just trying harder and becoming better because we can never do that. It's a matter of surrendering to you. And so we do. Knowing that because you made us in your image, you love us, you have a stake in us, and that helps us to understand why Jesus came and paid the price for our sins. And so we put our trust in him. We accept your spirit. We expect, ex accept the transformation you've offered to us and the forgiveness and peace. Help us to tell the message and to live the message. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing this. Let's stand and sing the chorus to that last song again. Oops. <laughs> I won't touch, Marcy. It's all yours. <laughs> wonderfully made. I'm so wonderfully different than a wombat. What a great God. I'm so different than a dingo. Wonderfully made. I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great God. I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a dingo. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Go in peace and joy and relish the fact that God made you in his image.